Well, good morning, everyone. Let's stand together. Those of you that are standing, you can stay standing. Why don't you find somebody that you haven't talked to yet this morning? Say hi to someone this morning before we get started. Welcome uh, our guests. We especially are glad that you are here today. Why don't you find some people that you haven't talked to yet this morning? Say, I'm glad that you're in church with me today. Now that you're comfortably seated, you can stand up. We are joining together in worship today. If you are a guest with us again, thanks for joining us. My name is Kevin Anderson. I'm the pastor here. And uh, today starts our Holy Spirit Conference with uh, Ruthie Oberg. We're glad to have Ruthie here from the uh, Mecca, the Magic City, okay, Springfield. And uh, so we're going to be talking more about that a little bit later as well. But we want to just encourage you, uh, today is the day that the Lord has made. And the Bible says, I will rejoice. The psalm says, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Just out of curiosity, how many of you had a fantastic week this last week? Okay, how many of you had a not-so-fantastic week this last week? How many of you don't remember what kind of week you had this last week? Okay, regardless of the week that we've had, our privilege and opportunity is that we can come together, fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. The first song that we're going to sing is Yes and Amen. And I want you to be thinking about this because I'm going to ask in just a little bit, what are some of the promises that God has given us? Because Scripture in this song says, you know what, all His promises are yes and amen. God does not back down on a promise. When He says something, it's going to happen. So we're going to sing this, we're going to declare this, and then we're going to just share some of those promises, okay? Lord God, thank you that we have the privilege and opportunity to come together today to worship you, to fix our eyes on Jesus, and Lord God, to remind ourselves again of the incredible promises that you've given us. Lord, you are a trustworthy God. When you make a promise, it will come to pass. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that we can hold on to that anchor today. Lord, even as we began our Holy Spirit conference today, Lord, we thank you that, that you have promised that you would send the helper, and you did. And so, Lord, we thank you for that, that that promise has been fulfilled. And, Lord, we can experience that empowerment, that strength of the Holy Spirit today. Lord God, I pray that you just open our eyes today to a greater revelation of who you are, what you desire to do in us, and what you desire to do through us. And, Lord, may our worship be pleasing to you now. In your name we pray. And, Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are. Faithful forever. promises are yes and amen all your promises are yes and amen beautiful savior beautiful savior you have brought me near you pulled me from the ashes you have broken every curse Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. promises are yes and amen all your promises and all your promises are yes let's sing in the chorus again faithful you are faithful 
faithful you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful you are, all your promises are yes and amen, all your promises are yes, I will rest. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest. In your promises, my confidence is your faith. One more time, I will rest. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Faithful you are. Faithful. promises are yes and amen all your promises are yes and amen now kathy's going to keep playing that pastor vondell don't you just grab that microphone right there if you would i this is uh, open mic now okay what are some promises that maybe you've grabbed a hold of or maybe just that come to mind just as we sing that let me give you a couple and pastor vondell is going to be running like uh, a madman just bringing the mic to anybody that's raising their hand okay so if you got one ready, okay, go ahead and go over there because we're going to hear that just a minute, okay? One of the promises God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise. I'm going to be glad for that promise. That's a promise. We can believe that, okay? Another promise. Salvation. Okay, God has promised salvation. Everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 10, 27 and 28. He said, <clears throat> we, I know my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall not perish can snatch them out of my hands. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Angelina. Okay, somebody else. Another promise. A promise of God. If you cast all your cares on him, he will care for you. Okay, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. That's a promise. He promises peace in the midst of a storm. Peace in the midst of the storm. How many of you have experienced that promise? Everything around you is chaos, but there is a peace. Okay, somebody else. Healing. Healing. He said, I will heal all of your sicknesses, all of your diseases. We are adopted as his children. We are promised that we are children of the Most High God. Okay, anybody else? Call unto me, I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you do not even know. Comforter. Comforter, okay. He has promised he would send the comforter, that he would give comfort in the times of challenge, difficulties. Okay, a couple more. I know the plans I have for you. That's a promise, okay? God knows the plans that he has for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, okay? Another one. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. How many of you experienced that one? That's a good promise right there, okay? Can we declare this right now? Let's just say, just say it again. Faithful you are. Can we say this right to him? Sing it like we mean it now. Faithful you are. Our sins will be taken away. Faithful. Faithful forever you will be, and faithful you are. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises, all your promises are yes and amen. Faithful and faithful you are. Faithful promises are yes and amen all your promises let's sing it again i will rest i will rest in your promises my confidence 
is your faithfulness I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness yes I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. Can we just declare that today, that I am resting in the promises of God? Lord, we thank you that in you we have hope. Lord, you have good plans for us. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that the challenges and difficulties of this world, Lord, that they don't have to overwhelm us, Lord. We've got our eyes fixed on something else. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me and then out of the darkness then on the morning that sealed the promise the buried body began to breathe out of the darkness the burning light declared 
the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living. Just the voices now, voices and drums. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. Thank you, Lord. God, we thank you for that. Thank you for that victory, Lord God. Thank you for that. Church, can we just lift our voice and just declare the goodness of God, the victory that we have in the name of Jesus. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. God, we declare your goodness. We declare your power today. God, we thank you that we do not have to be victims. Lord God, that we are overcomers. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, God. We thank you, Lord, that our hope Lord, it isn't just a mystical hope that's out there, but, Lord, our hope has a name. Lord, God, we can fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, who is our hope? Lord, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, when Jesus is involved, there is always hope. There is always hope. And, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that, Lord, God. There is a song I know it well, a melody that's never failed on mountains high in valleys low my soul will rest my confidence in you alone hope has a name his name is jesus Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. Thank you, Lord. There's a light. There is a light, salvation's flame, Christ undefeated, trampled the grave. See now the cross, lifted high, the light has come, the light has won, behold the Christ, hope has a name. His name is Jesus, my Savior's cross 
has set the sinner free oh, as a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free oh, as a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. This is the blessed hope that we have now that we're going to spend eternally with him in heaven. There'll be a day my hope complete now home in glory your face i'll see my pain no more my fear will cease i bow my life i fix my eyes on christ my king i bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ, my King. Hope has a name, His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, His name is Jesus. Christ be praised, I have victory. Let's sing it again. Hope has a name. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory, oh Christ be praised, I have victory, oh Christ be praised, I have Church, uh, before I have you sit down this morning, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, there's two specific areas that I want to bring before you this morning. One is an open door that the Lord has given us just recently um, with uh, Pitcher Park. It's our our neighbors that are really close to the church, kind of right behind the Coke plant. Um, a few years ago, we, uh, we were able to do some ministry over there. And... Uh, then last year, due to COVID, we were not able to go in there, but uh, this year we were able, we even got uh, the manager stop me, giving me an invite to say, hey, we would we would love for you to come back over here and, and do some ministry. And so what we have planned is Saturday, October 16th, to do a block party over at Pitcher Park. And kind of a, a quick version of what it's gonna look like our plan is to start at 4 o'clock, and uh, we will bring a bunch of grills over there and provide supper for the, the trailer park. There's 108 homes there that, uh, that uh, in that park, and um, we're going to bring out our lawn games. We're going to bring Gaga Ball and, and like uh, Tug of War and all that good stuff. And then throughout the, the time of our, we're there, we're going to have different ones come up to the microphone and share testimonies and uh, share testimonies of how you have encountered Jesus and how Jesus has changed your life. And we want people in our city to know that Jesus brings hope. And we want them to know that they are not alone, that their friends right over here at River of Life care about them and love them. And uh, so just... Uh, Letting you know we're going to need your help on October 16th, but we want to begin to pray about that open door even now. And so if you would help me pray for that, 
And then we have also been aware that uh, this weekend, there's just kind of multiple people that we've been made aware of that are, are, are sick, not doing well this weekend, just, just needing a touch from God. And so we want to bring them before the Lord in prayer this morning. So, and you probably come this morning with your own needs, your own situations. Let's bring that to the Lord in prayer. Let's lay these things at his feet right now. Lord, we thank you that you are so faithful and so good. Lord, we thank you for the open doors that you've given us in, in our city, Lord, to reach people for you. And Lord, we pray blessing over the people of Pitcher Park. We pray, Lord, that you would go before us, Lord, just preparing hearts for that weekend. Lord, that you would give us open doors all the way, Lord, to people having encounters with you. And Lord, we pray that you would raise up the team that we're needing for ministry that weekend. We pray that you would give us a heart of love and compassion for the ones that you love. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless this and use it for your glory, honor, and praise. Lord, this morning we pray for those uh, that are not feeling well, those who have been sick, those who have been fighting different illnesses and viruses and things. Lord, we proclaim healing over them right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that you're our healer, that by your wounds, Jesus, we have been healed. And we proclaim that power and that healing over every single one in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you this morning that we can gather this morning with great expectation on this Holy Spirit conference, that Holy Spirit, you're alive and well. And Lord, you're faithful to every promise that you've made. That Father, you've promised that you will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And I praise you and thank you. Have your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, I'm going to let you have a seat this morning, and uh, starting next Sunday night, we have Alpha beginning, and so we want everyone on board, so check out this video. Well, we are excited about Alpha starting here, but we're, uh, we're actually not going to be at River of Life. When you came in, you should have got one of those cards in your bulletin. Uh, it says, uh, it's got uh, the Alpha logo on there. It's got a You're Invited on the back of that. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have participated in Alpha before? Okay, we did it a number of years ago here. Other churches have done it. You're familiar with it. Um, what we're doing is uh, we realize that some, even with watching the little videos here, you're still not real sure what it's all about. So today, actually, immediately after the service at about 1130, uh, if you want to just find out a little bit more, we're just doing a real brief, we call it just first look. 
uh, back in the conference room, which is the room just right across from the restrooms. And uh, we've got a couple of our table leaders that are going to be there. Renee, why don't you stand and wave so everybody knows who you are. Darren and Amy, you want to stand so they know who you are. They're going to be back there. Just uh, uh, And again, we just want, we're not going to make it real quick and uh, uh, answer any questions that you may have about Alpha. Uh, the invitations, certainly we want you to be invited, but we also encourage you to uh, maybe uh, hand that to someone else, perhaps a, co- perhaps a co-worker, a family, a friend, a neighbor, a relative, whatever, and uh, just say, you know what, just come and check it out. There's no commitment to it. Come and check it out. Uh, begins next Sunday night at 630 and uh, if you want more details, actually, you can go on to our YouTube channel. There's uh, about three or four promotional videos uh, that are on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can check that out or refer people to those videos as well. And maybe you'd say, you know what? Yeah, I think I'm ready to check it out. Uh, if you are ready to register or maybe you've got some more questions, uh, you can actually just text the word ALPHA, A-L-P-H-A, to 701 701- Three five three two four nine eight, and that number is in your bulletin as well. And uh, we will have somebody get in touch with you to find out if there's any more questions that we can answer for you. Uh, this again, it's for people from our church, but it is certainly for people for our community as well. You saw the video; it's really just creating an environment where people can be free to ask questions uh, just about their faith. And we recognize that people are at various places, maybe in their faith journey, and so we want to be uh, open and sensitive to be able to answer some of those questions and give them opportunity to ask those questions. So, more information uh, in your uh, bulletin. On that paper as well, would you just take that out? Actually, I'm going to dismiss kids for kids church right now. Monica, oh, there is no kids church? Okay, it's family church today, so there's no kids church today. So, Monica needs to stand someplace other than the back uh, when there's family church. Maybe, okay, we need to clip because when she's standing there, I'm just assuming that she's trying to get my attention to send kids to kids church. Okay, there is no kids church today. Let's welcome our kids to family church today, okay? <laughs> So there are busy bags that are being handed out there. And uh, so, anyway, other things that are on the, the paper, you notice that the, the bulletin, uh, we kind of put the heading, Connect, Grow, Serve. Those are three things that we're encouraging everybody to participate in. We want everybody to connect. We want everybody to grow, everybody to serve. And all of the things that are listed on that paper are opportunities for you to do one or multiple of those things. So I just encourage you, don't just uh, glance at it and throw it to the side. That is your opportunity to say, you know what, I need to connect. I want to meet some other people. There's some things I need to grow. There's opportunities that are there, opportunities to serve. Fellowship Register is going to be coming in just a moment. And uh, more details, you can check information on that or stop by our next step table, which is the table uh, right in the back of the, uh, the sanctuary here. Well, we are excited today to start the, uh, the Holy Spirit Conference. And uh, we have been praying about this uh, promoting it, letting people know that this is coming. Uh, We had the privilege and opportunity to have Ruthie Oberg with us in July to celebrate our uh, our 90th anniversary. Uh, Ruthie, welcome back to Devil's Lake. Um, For those of you that weren't here in July, just a little bit of background. Uh, Ruthie works at the Flower Pentecostal Heritage Center. And uh, so I did a little research and pulled up some stuff online. For those of you that don't know, the Flower Pentecostal Heritage Center is the largest Pentecostal archive in the world. In the world, okay? Located in the National Office of Assemblies of God, Springfield, Missouri. Uh, it collects printed materials, oral histories, artifacts, photographs, memorabilia, uh, documenting the Assemblies of God and the broader Pentecostal and charismatic movements spanning the globe. And again, we talked on this some of it uh, in July about the incredible growth that's taken place in the Pentecostal movement uh, really around the world. If I remember right, just 5%. Is it 5% in the United States? Okay, okay. Hold tight. She's going to be talking about that, okay? Uh, So uh, anyway, Ruthie is uh, ordained Assemblies of God minister and has served in senior and associate pastor roles uh, for over 25 years. Uh, She's done a number of uh, speaking engagement churches, conferences, uh, also produced a daily radio program. Uh, Her articles have appeared in the Pentecostal Evangel, Enrichment Magazine, Assemblies of God Heritage. Uh, She regular contributor to This Week in AG History. And again, she was here in July, so many of you will not be uh, seeing her for the first time, but if you are, uh, you are in for a treat. We encourage you, not just this morning, uh, but this evening as well. We're going to kind of change things up a little bit. We're actually doing a light meal this evening uh, at 5.30 back in the Fellowship Hall, and then uh, uh, Ruthie will be sharing back in the Fellowship Hall uh, tonight at 6.30 and tomorrow at 7.00. 
Tomorrow there's another light meal, so I just encourage if you're coming right from work, you can come right here. You don't have to grab anything to eat. We'll take care of the food here, uh, but we're excited about the next couple of nights. But let's do this. Let's welcome Ruthie uh, to River of Life Assembly again this morning, can we? And everything he told you about the Heritage Center is true. And matter of fact, this week, because um, we are an international research center, people come from literally all over the world. And this week, we had um, a professor there studying a Dr. Cho from Seoul, Korea. Some of you are familiar with his name. He passed away a little over a week ago, pastor of the world's largest church, which happened to be Assemblies of God. And um, so there was a, a professor from Emory University there studying his life, preparing to do some writing on that. And then we had someone there studying uh, West Africa. And we had someone else there studying in another area that I can't remember because I didn't get to meet them. They just told me they were on their way. So it is a pleasure to be with you in North Dakota. In just in this year, I've been in North Dakota three times. I was in Minot in January, and I would not recommend that anybody go to Minot in January. Unless, of course, you live there and just enjoy that, then live it up. And so at that point, it was, it was below zero. And then I was here in July, and if you remember the service I was here, we were in the tent with no air conditioner, and it hit 97. Y'all remember that? And you came back. <laughs> but today it's supposed to be a lovely 70 something or other so it's somewhat normal so it is so good to be with you and let me just say I am glad to see the kids here today so I'm going to do something that I, I typically did when we had kids in our church that I was pastoring if you are below the age of 12 and after service, you can come up and tell me something that I said that you remember that you learned. Or if you will draw me a picture that has something to do with something I said and you come back tonight, I will give you a dollar. I would give you the dollar today so you can go get a Coke, except I didn't know you could be here, so I have no ones. And so I will get some ones this afternoon. Okay, so if you're under 12... And you can come tell me something I said. Now, this is not if you're 65 and you just want a Coke. No. If you're under 12 and you can tell me something I said that you learned or draw me a picture that has something to do with something I said this morning and come back tonight to get your dollar, then, then we'll be on it. And I will have a, a magic trick tonight that I just do for grown-ups, but if kids are here, that's just great. Um, when I was, was pastoring, I, I, I love kids. I am a mom. And so I had three kids of my own, and then we had 32 foster kids. So there always were kids in and out of our home. So I love to see kids in church. Y'all look great. So I'm glad we're having family church today. Thank you, pastors, for doing that. That's a nice surprise for me. Well, let's go ahead and get the stuff up there on the screen because I don't have any notes. So I'm going to trust Corbin. You are in charge. You got it? I can just see the top of his head, but it was nodding. <laughs> When I was here with you before, um, for those of you who were here on Saturday night, we went through a historical period where we talked about a desire in the hearts of people for holiness and to understand what it meant to be filled with the Spirit. How many of you were here for that Saturday night and you remember a little bit of that? All right, six of you. That's wonderful. So you'll have to fill in everybody else on a little later. I'm going to tell you this, this morning a little more of the rest of that story. And then tonight and tomorrow night, we're going to get into some very practical teaching on what it means to live out this idea of being spirit-filled. We're going to have a lot of questions, and with the Lord's help, we'll have some answers. And the stuff that we don't have answers for, we'll ask the Lord to help us or we'll Google. <laughs> if it's factual, we can Google off. And if we just need the guiding of the Lord, then, then that's something we need to pray about. I want to open with a scripture for you this morning that if you've been around our churches for a while is very familiar to you. In the book of Acts, chapters 1 and chapter 2, we find the continuation of the book of Luke. Now we know that Luke was written by a guy named Luke, all right, excellent. And he wrote the book of Luke as a testament, as the story of Jesus Christ on earth and his ministry on earth. He was writing to a primarily Gentile audience 
and he's telling the story of Jesus. And when he gets to the end of his book, he, he takes a pause, turns a page, and then when he begins to write again, it's called the book of the Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, sometimes called the book of the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. So he starts it out, and he says, in the first book, this is chapter 1, verse 1, in the first book, O Theophilus, that's a Greek guy, his name means the lover of God. Isn't that a great name? So if any in here are expecting, here's a great name for your kid, Theophilus. <laughs> in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. And afterward, he gave commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, let's go down to verse 4 here where it says, so when they had come together, this is Jesus and the apostles. He's already been resurrected, and he's taking them. He's giving them last-minute instructions, and this is what he says. First, they ask him a question, which I think is reasonable. If Jesus was standing before you, and he had come back from the dead, and you've been walking together, would you have some questions? Yeah, me too. And so they ask a question, and it's a question people still ask today. It says, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed. That, so there is something he says that is not for us. You catch that? So when you, you start hearing some of these people saying, this is when Jesus is coming back, and sometimes we'll hear preachers say that they've studied the Bible, and on this date he'll return. That's happened several times throughout history. According to Jesus, that's not for us to know. There are some things that are not for us. But here's the great thing about the Lord. When he tells us what's not for us, he follows it up with what is for us. Because this is what he says. It's not for you to know the times and seasons. Instead, what you are going to get is power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So it's not for you to have all the knowledge of all the inner secret workings of God. It is for you to have power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then he said to them to go to Jerusalem and wait for this power. So what did the disciples do? Anybody know? They went to Jerusalem. They got to Jerusalem, and they are there, and for 10 days... They met together regularly in the upper room, and it seems that they took time out for the regular prayers at the temple, and then they would gather back together, waiting for this promise of the Holy Spirit. We get to verse, or chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, so this is a Jewish feast day, the, the feast of the harvest. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly... There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire, so there's something visible that they see here, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that what Jesus told them to wait for? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here they are, waiting together. There's 120 of them, men and women, all together in this room, waiting for the promise of the Lord. And then on the day of Pentecost, that promise was fulfilled, and the Holy Spirit came on them. So if you have ever heard of a church called a Pentecostal church, how many have you ever heard of that? Yeah, that's where they get their name, from this festival, the day of Pentecost. Now, um, what is the name of your church? River of Life, Assembly of God. Okay, because I don't always know where I am, so thank you. River of Life, Assembly of God. Now, that doesn't say anything about being Pentecostal. What kind of church is this? If you were to say, somebody asked you, what kind of church do you go to? What would you say? 
Is that what you'd say? Or would you say, I go to the Assembly of God down the street? And the Assembly of God Church, maybe we'll talk about some of that this week and how that all got started. We'll, we'll see where we go. But the Assemblies of God Church is part of that Pentecostal movement. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today of how that movement got started. So are you ready for a story? Matthias, you ready? Okay. Matthias is ready. Anybody else is ready? Yeah. All right. We're going to have a story. So Corbin, I can't see you, so you're going to have to watch me for when I point at you, Okay. All right, got it. All right, so the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the folks that followed along with the stories I told you last time. In the late 1800s of that holiness movement, there were three things that we talked about, three teachings that became very prominent, particularly in the United States, but also in other pockets of the world during this time. And so we're going to look at them. So go ahead and hit three times for me there, Corbin. One, two, three. Thank you. Here's these three things, and we've got some big words. You ready for a big word? Because if you can remember these big words and tell me after, I'll give you a dollar, okay? And there'll be somewhere in this world you can buy a Coke for that. Not at the gas station, but somewhere in this world. <laughs> One of them is premillennialism. That simply means pre is a prefix, which means something that comes before, right? Millennialism. Millennial is a word that means 1,000 years. And so what this teaching that really began to be emphasized was that there was going to be an actual return of Christ to the earth before the millennial reign. It would be a literal return of Christ. Up until this point, the majority of teaching in Christian churches was something called amillennialism, which meant that the, the reign of Christ, the return of Christ, was already happening through the church. That's the prominent teaching in Catholicism, right? That the Pope, as the representative of Christ on earth, is, is showing the reign of Christ on the earth. But these people in, in this Protestant movement, particularly around this time, really started to teach that there was going to be an actual return of Christ, not the church ruling the world, but Christ ruling the world. So you following me? So there's this emphasis then on Christ is going to return to earth. Now, along with that came an understanding that as Christ was preparing the world for his return, that he would be restoring the church to its earlier power. And so they went and began to look at church history books. And what is the very first church history book? The book of Acts. And so they went back to the book of Acts and began to read in there what did the church look like at its beginning, at its core. And then seeking God that he would restore the church to that original power that it had. And so that's why you'll sometimes call here the Assemblies of God or Pentecostal churches called rest restoration movements. Because we believe that God is restoring his church in the fullness of power. And then the third thing then, if Jesus is coming and if he is restoring his church... What kind of people ought we to be? And that brought in something called the holiness movement. And these people in the holiness movement began to seek after the fullness of what God had for them. Now that's a, a brief summary of what we talked about two months ago. You all remember that? Right, okay. Corbin, let's keep going. Now, one of these men, go ahead and flip me until we've got that whole, that whole screen full. Thank you, Corbin. One of these men, go back, thank you. One of these men that was involved in the holiness movement, he was a Methodist preacher in Kansas. And as he began to seek after God, he felt that God was calling him to do some, some things that, that other holiness ministers were doing. One of them was to start a healing home. Now, this was really common at the end of the 1800s when these holiness people, what they would do is they would get a home because in, in this time in, in our history, going to the doctor was almost as dangerous as 
not going to the doctor. There was a lot of quackery during this time. And that is why it is during the this, this same time period in the 1800s that we see a rise in the health movement in the United States, like the YMCA and Mr. Kellogg making his magic cornflakes and Mr. Graham making his healing crackers. Those Kellogg's cornflakes and Graham crackers were started to be a healing health movement. Now they're killing us because we put sugar on them. But in the beginning, they were supposed to make us well. So all of this is going on. And these people, as they began to look at that first church history book, said, you know, I believe that the Lord is interested in our health as well. When Jesus went around, it said he went around doing good and healing those who were full of disease. And so what these guys did was they started healing homes where they would invite people to come in. If you're sick, so you're sick, you're not feeling good, okay, and you just can't seem to get better then you can go to one of these homes and they've got a room just for you where they'll feed you, take care of you, make sure you get rest, and they will pray for God to touch you. And guess what? It didn't cost you anything. This was called a faith movement. And so they would take care of you and pray for you and trust God to heal you. Well, Parm started one of these healing homes in Topeka. And then, after running that for a while, along with his wife and his sister-in-law, Lillian, they decided to open a Bible school because so many people that were coming through their healing home and other people that they were meeting needed to really get into the Word of God and study. So here's what he did. Oh, that's a hymnal. Let me grab the, the Bible. Got a Bible and a hymnal in there. So what he did was he put out an advertisement in his newspaper called the, that was called the Apostolic Faith Paper. And he put out an advertisement. Here's what he said. He invited everybody to sell everything they had and give the money that they made from that big sale to the poor, move to Topeka, and dedicate themselves to the study of the Word of God. Now, how many of you are ready to sign up? Because you don't even get to keep your money after you sell all that stuff. And you don't give it to him. You give it to the poor. You leave all of that behind and come study the Bible. Would you believe 40 people responded? They show up in Topeka, Kansas, and they had rented this big building there that you see over there that's called Stone's Folly. It had been started by a man by the name of Stone. He was going to build this big mansion, and then he didn't count the cost and ran into some recession stuff and couldn't finish it. So Parham got it for a little bit of nothing to rent. And so what they would do, here was, here was how they would go to school. Imagine if this was how you had school. What they do is the teacher would give a topic. Like, say, let's study the grace of God. So that's your topic. And then everyone would take their textbook. And the only textbook in this school was the Bible. So they would take the textbook off by themselves to the room, and they would study, and they would write down everything that they could learn about grace. And then the next step in the class was to get everybody together, and then they would share their notes of what they learned about grace. And then the last step in the lesson would be that they would have a prayer meeting, an extended several days prayer meeting, praying into their lives the application of what they had learned. So not a, really a bad way to study. We could do that today, couldn't we? Yeah, and so it was around Christmas time. Parham was leaving on a trip to go out east, and he gave the assignment, and here was the assignment. They had been, in, in this holiness movement, they had been talking about the importance of being filled with the Spirit, and how do we know that we have been filled with the Spirit? And that was what Parham told them. He said, your lesson while I'm gone, I want you to study the Scriptures. How can we know we've been filled with the Spirit? What is the biblical evidence to tell us that we have actually experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit? So Parham went on his trip, and the students got together, and, well, they went off with their Bibles all alone and began to study. So let's say that, that you're on this, this assignment, okay? So go ahead, Corbin, to the next thing. So as they start to look in the Bible, they look to see, well, what was the experience of the early church? Well, we see people filled with the Spirit. And so they looked, and they said, okay, in, in Acts chapter 2, it says, Okay, I got it here. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they took out their notebooks and wrote Acts 2, 
um, they spoke with tongues, and that's how they knew. And then they went on and looked for the next instance where it says they were filled with the Spirit. They get over here to chapter 8 in Samaria, and it says, While Peter was still preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they were filled, and they heard them speak in tongues. And so they got out their notebook, and they wrote Acts 8. They spoke in tongues, it was, then they could hear it. Then they get to Acts chapter 10. Cornelius, oh, I'm sorry, I got backwards. I was at Cornelius' house in 10. 8, Samaria, let me go backwards for you. In Samaria, when they got there, they had these people that had gotten saved, and they called the apostles. Peter comes down, and they start praying for them. And when they pray for them, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And as soon as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, there was another guy there by the name of Simon. And he was very interested in magic kind of stuff. And so what Simon did was he comes to the apostles and said, that is incredible. I've never seen anything like that. How much can I pay you to teach me how to do that where I can lay hands on people and this thing that just happened will happen? And Peter said, said to him, literally, the literal translation is to hell with you and your money. This isn't for sale. And so we know that something visible happened that was supernatural. And so that's what they write down, visible, supernatural. Then they get to Acts 10. That's the one we talked about in Cornelius' house. And then in Acts chapter 19 in the book of Ephesus, when they get there, they find that here's some believers in Ephesus and Paul gets there and he says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, when you got saved? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, we've never heard of any Holy Spirit. And so on hearing this, Paul laid his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And so they write down in their notebooks in Acts 19, spoke in tongues and prophesied. Some kind of ecstatic speech. So they've got all of this together. So when Parham comes back, they come together and they discuss their notes from their study. And each of the students discovered the same thing, that there was something visible, supernatural, and it seemed to include ecstatic speech, particularly speaking in other tongues. And so as they began studying that and discussing it, what's the next thing they do in their, in their lessons? They pray an application into their lives. And so their prayer meeting was scheduled for December 31st. Remember that Parham come from a Methodist background and watch night services were started by John Wesley. So very common for a Methodist preacher to have that. We have them sometimes in our churches. So December 31st, the last night, of the year, they gathered for prayer specifically to pray in the application of what they had been studying. And just a little bit after midnight, one of the students, go ahead to the next slide there, one of the students named Agnes Osman, this is a picture of her when she was older, but when she was younger when she was at the school. A little after midnight, she came over to Parham, the teacher, and said, I would like you, like it says in the Bible, to lay hands on me, and I believe that I will experience what they experienced in the Bible. And so the students gathered around Agnes, laid hands on her, began to pray that she would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit the same way it happened in Scripture. And Agnes, just a little after midnight, and I find it, it just, just interesting because I like numbers, in the first hour of the first day of the first month of the first year of the new century, the Holy Spirit came upon this young woman in Topeka, Kansas, and she began to speak with other tongues. Later in that prayer meeting, several others did. A few days later, Parham himself, some of the others in the school, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so go ahead to the next slide, Corbin. And so Parham then begins to travel around, and his students began traveling, sharing about this this new understanding that we can receive everything that God has promised to us now, just like they did in the Bible. And what happened in the Bible, the power that the apostles have, we can share as believers in Jesus Christ. Now, this was a pretty new message. To so some of you, you're sitting there going, yeah, well, duh, of course. 
But this was a new message. So Parham comes then, he has an invitation to the Houston area, and he has several people around that area, Orchard, Richmond, Katie, Alvin, Angleton, Needville, Crosby, and Houston. Now we've got a brother here whom I don't see who's from Houston, but those names will be familiar to him. I know because I grew up in Houston, and we played all those people in football. And he set up another Bible school there in Houston, and he invited everyone to come, and he would teach them, and they would pray through the same way that they did in Topeka, the same kind of things. Now, his, he had a young lady, Lucy Farrell, who was helping to take care of his kids. And she had a friend that she had met by the name of William Seymour. And they were both African-American. And Lucy said to William, I really think that you would enjoy this teaching. William's, William was a phenomenal preacher, and he was already ordained with a holiness group called the Evening Light Saints. Now, the Evening Light Saints as a holiness group had already tackled this idea of what is the evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And before 1900, they had already put together a document of the things that would be part of your life if you were filled with the Holy Spirit. One of those in their founding document is that those who are filled with the Holy Spirit will see an eradication of racial prejudice. And a sign of the Holy Spirit within you would be that we would understand the brotherhood of all humanity. And as such, then, the Evening Light Saints were one of the few white groups that ordained on equal standing African-American brothers and sisters. So William Seymour was a black man who was, who was ordained with this Evening Light Saints. And so they invited him to come to the school. Now, there are two different stories here, and I'm only throwing them out because sometimes they get printed, and if you have read some of this, some, not all the things that are in there are totally accurate. Some of the books printed about this say that William Seymour had to sit outside of the classroom because of the Jim Crow laws. Now, the Jim Crow laws were in place, the classrooms were segregated. The only reason that that is said that Seymour had to sit outside the classroom was because that was the law. Did Parham actually make him do that? We don't know. So when you read that, just know it could have been or it might not have been. From some of the things we know about Parham later, I think it is very possible that Seymour was outside the classroom. But it's not something that we know. But either way, Seymour heard all of this teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, believed it. Now, he didn't experience it, but he believed it. Now, meanwhile, the, over in Los Angeles, there is a lady by the name of Julia Hutchins, another black sister who is pastoring a holiness church. And she feels the call of God to be a missionary to Liberia. Liber Liberia was, was a colony that was set up where freed slaves could return to Africa and, and have a home there. And she wanted to go and set up churches in Liberia for these freed slaves who spoke English and not the languages of West Africa. So she needed somebody to take care of her church. So she heard from another friend about this great preacher in Houston, invited Seymour, and Seymour goes to Parham, the teacher. And he says to him, I have this invitation to go to Los Angeles to take a church. Um, what do you think I should do? Parham responded with, I don't think you should go because I need you here. Parham had in mind that Seymour was going to start the colored work, is what he called it, the colored work among the Pentecostals coming out of Houston. But nonetheless, Parham felt that he should go to Los Angeles. So he takes all of his money, buys a train ticket, goes to Los Angeles, and shows up at his new church. He stands up to preach, and the very first sermon he preaches in his new church, he turns them to the book of Acts, read to them the passage I just read to you from Acts 1 and Acts 2, and then made the statement that we can expect today that the same God of the book of Acts will fill us with the same spirit, and we can expect the same results that they saw then. Now, he had not experienced any of that, but he believed it, and he preached it. 
And that night, the leaders of the church met together to talk about this new teaching that their new pastor was teaching. And rather than contact him to ask about it, they just changed the lock on the door. And when Seymour showed up for the next service, his key didn't work. He had been locked out. Now, remember, he has spent all of his money to get to Los Angeles. And now he's got to figure out he's got no job. He's got nothing. What is he going to do? Does he return to Houston? So while he's trying to decide what to do, two members of the church, Ed and Maddie Lee. Ed and Maddie invited him to come stay in their home to tell if he could figure out what to do. And they said to him, while you're here, could we have a Bible study? We'd like to hear more about what you're teaching. <clears throat> Go ahead to the next slide there, Corbin. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, there's Seymour. Go ahead. That's his picture if you wanted to see him. Go ahead to the next one. And so Seymour began having this Bible study at Ed and Maddie's house. Well, pretty soon, so many people wanted to come. And I've been to these houses in Los Angeles. You can still visit them. The house was very small. And soon, so many people were wanting to come to the Bible study that Ed and Ruth's house was too small or Ed and Maddie, so they went to the home down the street of some other friends of theirs, Richard and Ruth Asbury. They lived on Bonnie Bray Street. And so they moved down there to start having the Bible study. On April 9th, um, Seymour is still saying over at Ed's house, Ed came home from his janitor job, and he wasn't feeling very well, but he wanted to go to the Bible study that night. And so he said to Seymour, would you pray for me that God will touch me and I'll feel better so I'll have energy to go to the study tonight? reasonable request and so Seymour lays hands on Ed Lee begins to pray for him and out of Ed begins to flow this language that none of them had ever heard now this was the first time that any of them had seen this Ed begins to speak this, and so William and Maddie grab Ed, drag him down the street to the house at, at, on Bonnie Bray and tell Richard and Ruth, look what, what's happening to Ed. They begin to praise God as people become, come in for the study. Then the Spirit falls on that night, April 9th, 1906, and several of them, including Seymour, are baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Well, news travels fast in a small community, yeah? And while Los Angeles is a big city, let me just tell you, when you are part of a minority community in a big city, news travels fast in that community. And so pretty soon, everybody has heard about this study and what's happening over at the Asbury House on Bonnie Bray. And so people start coming and coming and coming just over the next couple days. And it got to where there's so many people that you can see the porch there. Seymour was having to stand on the porch to preach to all the people out in the yard. And people were starting to clamor for the porch. And, and Richard said, hey, you're breaking my porch and I love you and everything, but you're going to have to go somewhere else if this is going to get bigger. So they began to look for a place that they could meet. Go ahead to the next slide, Corbin. What they found was an abandoned um, old church. It had been an African Methodist Episcopal church that had caught on fire. The church moved out, and they were using it as a livery stable. So this, this section of Los Angeles Azusa Street was the lumber district. And so what they had happening on the bottom of, of this former church was this was the horse stables, you know, because they would pull the lumber wagons. You had to have horses to pull the wagons. And so this is where the horses were stabled and excess lumber. And so Seymour got the bottom of this building for $8 a month. And they moved in. They got it on Saturday, August the 14th excuse me, April the, April 14th, and they went to work immediately because the next Sunday was Sunday. And they wanted to have, it was Easter Sunday, they wanted to have Easter Sunday services in their new building. New building, are you excited about the horse stable? <clears throat> so they have to lay down a, a ton of sawdust to soak up. Are you with me? <laughs> to soak up what you would find in the horse stable? 
right? And horse flies, because, you know, there are eggs that are laid and all of that, and the flies that were there, they whitewashed the walls. There were some, some barrels of uh, 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 kegs that you'd put nails in. They brought those out and put, put lumber across each one of them to have some, some places to sit. For their pulpit, they put together, there were two large shoe boxes. Now, when, when we think of shoe boxes, we think like this. But I'm talking about like salesman sample shoe boxes, big boxes like this. They put one on top of the other, and that was their pulpit. They had some, an, old, an old beam that they used up on some, some bricks for an altar, and they set up their church, and they were so excited to have service on Easter Sunday, April 15, 1906. Go ahead to the, to the next slide, Corbin. And what happened was amazing. There is no other explanation than something supernatural. Because what we know, and this is, and remember, I, I work in, a, in an academic institution, so we, we make sure that our stuff is accurate. A conservative historical estimate is that over the next three years, at least 8,000 people went through these meetings. People began to come from everywhere. And I want you to notice the date here. Wednesday, April 18th, 1906. This church has been in existence three days. And they are already on the front page of the Los Angeles Daily Times. So you know something was happening, right? Front page. And you can, you can see the thing. Weird babble of tongues. New sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Wild scene last night on Azusa Street. Gurgle of wordless talk by a sister. And so we've got all of this stuff. Front page of the Daily Times. And, and, and so all of the, And this, of course, the publicity just is bringing more people. Word of mouth. And now it's the newspaper. But something happened that then brought even more people seeking because this was the morning edition. This is back when newspapers, you had a morning and an evening edition in Los Angeles at this time had at least 12 daily papers. The evening paper, Corbin, of, of Wednesday, April 16th, the evening paper carried this headline, Earthquake Levels San Francisco. The great San Francisco earthquake that many of you have heard of coincided exactly with what was happening in the Azusa Street Revival. And so all of a sudden, people felt this, th this urgency that San Francisco earthquake was felt in Los Angeles. And all the stories that they had heard about California is going to fall off into the ocean. And people began to start thinking about mortality. And so what happens is Frank Bartleman, a man who was attending the Azusa Street meetings, wrote a tract connecting the earthquake with what was happening and God pouring out his spirit in the last days on all of mankind. And people began to flock to this little bitty building in a black church on the wrong side of town. People were coming in, and so many accusations were, were late, sent against them. But the major one, if you read the papers, we have the papers in our archives. If you ever come to Springfield, you're welcome. Um, they've also been, been reprinted in some of the things. There's one whole book that pulls out just um, newspaper reportings of Azusa Street. And when you read those, the number one accusation against them was not the weird babble of tongues. It was not some of those. It was the fact that black and white people were mingling together. A black man was in leadership of white people. Sisters, women were speaking and, and sharing, not just white, but black, together, intermingling. And this incredible thing was happening. And so they're in the newspaper all the time. Next slide there, Corbin. Next slide. There you go. That's it right there. And so what Seymour did, because all of these papers were coming out, he decided, I better get the truth of everything that's happening. So he started publishing his own paper, and it reached a height of 50,000 subscribers. It's called the Apostolic Faith Paper. And you can see this, this one here, Pentecost has come. Los Angeles being visited by a revival of Bible, salvation, and Pentecost as recorded in the book of Acts. 
And so we have copies of all of these papers in our archives. So if you come to Springfield, you can stay at my house. You're welcome. And we'll bring you in. I'll take you into the vault, which is known as the Fort Knox of the Pentecostal world. And we can pull out some of these papers and read these testimonies. And it is like reading the book of Acts chapter 29. The continuation, because if you'll remember when we started Acts chapter 1 and we read verse 1, it said this is the continuation of what Jesus began to do and teach. And did you know what Jesus began to do and teach in the Gospels is meant to continue as long as there is a world in which we live? And so the understanding that these early Pentecostals have is that God is continuing what he did at the beginning of the church. He is continuing it now. So next slide there, um, Corbin. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. Now, the influence of this small congregation, go ahead and hit, give me two clicks. The influence of this small congregation locally, and I love this. If you will remember in the book of Acts, chapter 2, it talks about the different nations that were there. Do you remember that? I'm not going to take time to read it to you, but if, if you look, so they all heard in their own language, and it listed the different nationalities that were present. Out of this, this church in Azusa, one of the things that I think is so fascinating to me, Los Angeles then, much as now, was a place for immigrants. And we have, if you, you know enough American history to know that at the end of the 19th century, the late 1800s, we had mass immigration coming from, from Europe and around the world, but, but heavily from Eastern Europe and on. And so many of them had settled in the cities and communities. And here's what we find historically as we read the documents and gather this information, that out of the Azusa Street Revival started in a black church, we find Pentecostal churches being established in Los Angeles in the migrant communities. We see it in the Russian community, Armenian, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, Italian, German, Spanish, Japanese, and Chinese. Now that reads a little bit like Acts chapter 2, doesn't it? All of these people, God bringing the nations. God is about bringing the nations. And so is the Pentecostal movement. Pastor referred to it a little bit, and we'll talk about it more later. But um, for the Assemblies of God, only 5% of Assemblies of God people are in the United States. 95% of us are outside. We are not an American movement. We are a global movement. But the reaction of the Los Angeles churches as well, because, you know, anytime you get one church in a revival and people are flocking to it, where are they often flocking from? Other churches. <laughs> Other churches. And so now there is a meeting of the ministerial alliance in Los Angeles. What are we going to do with... <laughs> with what's happening. Our people are going, they're asking questions, they're asking questions like, should we go to, to these meetings? Or should we be having this here? Should we have people from there come to our church and teach us about this baptism in the Holy Spirit? And so through all of this, there's this ministerial meeting, and we have a copy of the letter that was sent by the pastor of Joseph Smale. He had been the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles, who it just happened... Uh, two years previous, had been to Wales and had taken part in a revival in Wales, came back to his church in Los Angeles and began to preach, we need revival in Los Angeles. And he had been preaching that. Matter of fact, we have a copy of a sermon series he wrote called The Pentecostal Blessing at First Baptist in Los Angeles before Azusa Street. This is how God was working. And in this, in this meeting, respected pastor Joseph Smale stands up and says, I think that we need to get behind whatever this is happening. Because here's, here's the truth, guys, he says to the other pastors. We need a rebirth of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here's, here's what the pastors did. You know, they didn't want all their people going over there to Azusa Street. So what did they start doing? They started having more prayer meetings. They started setting up more services. They started getting together to do evangelism in their own neighborhoods. And we began to see a resurgence of the church, not just the Pentecostal church, but in reaction to that, the mainline churches, some rejected it wholeheartedly, but for those who said, you know, we need something, 
we see a growth among them as well. Even though they didn't all join this movement, they saw a growth because they began to see the need. Okay, so that's locally. Corbin, what's next? We see the influence of this congregation on Azusa Street locally, but nationally. Nationally, G.B. Cashwell was a fellow from Tennessee. We know him as one of the founders of the Church of God of Cleveland. How many of you have ever heard of them? Yes, yeah, several of you. G.B. Caswell and the Holiness Churches down there that he led. Caswell did not want to go to Azusa Street when they told him, you need to go see what is happening here. And here's, here's what he said. I'm not going to go out there and have some black man lay hands on me. Tennessee. But God convicted him. He went, a black man laid hands on him. He received this experience, became convinced that it was not just something that was unique but was intended for all God's people, goes back and brings the church of God into the Pentecostal movement. C.H. Mason of the Church of God in Christ. We have his, his voice when he was older recording his experience. He's the founder of the largest black Pentecostal movement, which is the Church of God in Christ out of Memphis. We have a recording of him giving his testimony at Azusa Street and how God ministered to him. It's, it's absolutely incredible. He brought them into the Pentecostal movement. But also, as people from Azusa Street, they came and visited, and then they went home, they started starting new independent churches all around. And many of them we're going to see later join together to become the Assemblies of God. Okay, so nationally this, this congregation had influence. Corbin. Locally, nationally, and internationally, we have historical documents that can trace the beginnings of Pentecostalism straight from people who were at Azusa Street in England, Norway, Belgium, France, Germany, Switzerland, Poland, the Baltics, Russia, Italy, Iran, Argentina, Brazil, Armenia, Georgia, Turkey, China, India. Is that not Acts 2 language? Absolutely it is. As these people experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit, not, for, and I want you to catch this, not for the purpose of a supernatural experience like speaking in tongues, but for the purpose of power to transform the world around them. Too many times we get hung up on this idea of supernatural manifestations and we teach toward those and we tell people to seek after those but that is not what Pentecost is about the power of the Holy Spirit is about the transformation of a soul who then is so full of God that they can't stop pouring it out onto other people yeah yeah all right all right so now go ahead Corbin and I want you to yeah okay it can be safely said and, and this is, I'm speaking as a historian here, okay, because my, my, my studies are in church history. It can be safely said that no other single Christian congregation, go, go back for me, Corbin, except for that first Pentecostal church in Jerusalem. Remember in Jerusalem how they scattered into all the world and turned the world upside down in the book of Acts? No other single Christian congregation has had a similar impact upon the church and the world than this small African-American church on the bad side of Los Angeles. And I'm going to show you some stats to back that up. Now, Corbin. In 2020, now, I want you to get this. In 1905, there were no Pentecostal churches as we know them. In 2020, there were 289 million Pentecostal Christians worldwide, making up 4% of the world's population and 12.8% of the wider Christian population. Now get this, if we add charismatic Christians to that number with, with traditional Pentecostals who are part of denominations like the Assemblies of God, the, uh, uh, the Church of God, Church of God in Christ, Foursquare. If we add charismatics, people who are in other churches who claim this experience of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, if we add them to that, that's another 355 million, 4.4% of the world's population and 14% of the Christian population. So together, and I want you to see this, Pentecostals charismatics make up 26%, one in four of every Christian around the world 
And 8% of the world's population is part of the Pentecostal movement in 114 years. There is nothing comparable to that in the spread of religion past the first century church. Go ahead to the next slide, Corbin. Looking at the current global distribution, I know I talk about the world a lot, but I, I believe God's heart is for the nations. Looking at the global distribution of Pentecostal charismatic Christians, the World Christian Encyclopedia, not a Pentecostal publication, says that there are 644 million of us around the world. You are not alone, my brother. You are not alone, my sister. You are not part of some weird little subset of some bigger part of Christianity. You are part of a global movement. 230 million in Africa, 195 million in Latin America, 125 million in Asia, 68 million in North America, 21 million in Europe, and 4.5 million in Australia and Oceania. This is a global movement you are part of. Now, if we were to look at historically, and I've given you history this morning, we're going to do more practical stuff tonight and tomorrow. But if we were to, to take a look at, here we are in 1906, we've got all of these people who are out in Los Angeles. Now they're spreading across the nation and across the world with all of this. It leaves us now in 2020 still needing an understanding of what it means to be fully spirit-filled people. And so... There's just some questions that, that remain. Go ahead and give me several clicks there, Corbin. And we're going we're gonna to look at several of these things tonight. I hit mute, yeah. Oh, first, why should I be filled with the Spirit? And this is a fair question. Why? If only, if Pentecostals Charismatics only make up 26% of the broader, that means, what, 74%? Don't embrace this experience. Why is it important for me? Why should I be filled with the Spirit? Corbin, how can I receive this infilling? If it is something God has for me and I've not experienced this, how can I receive that, Corbin? Just keep clicking for me until you get to the bottom of the slide. There you go. Just keep going. What are the functions of speaking in tongues? We've talked about speaking in tongues in, in the Bible and then, and then some of that here in, in history. What are the functions? What is it for? It's a little weird. Why would I want to do that? And what, what would it look like biblically? What does it mean when the pastor says, we are being led by the Spirit to do this thing? Maybe he comes up with some wild harebrained scheme like, I don't know, trying to feed 108 people and families over in the trailer park and we feel like God has opened up this door for us. What does that mean to be led by the Spirit? Does it just mean we got a good idea? Or is, is there something more to it? How do I continue to grow in my spiritual life? Because, you, you know, okay, yeah, I had an experience back in 1984 with the Spirit, and I, I spoke in tongues, but I haven't done that since, and I haven't really noticed anything different from my life. I don't feel any more power than I felt before. How do I grow in that? How do I find my spiritual gifts? You know, I, I, you, you say that if you're filled with the Spirit, that, that God has purpose and power for you, how do I know what He wants me to do? And if we could be honest, let's ask this question. What if I'm afraid of weirdness <laughs> that I've seen and heard about in some places? You, you know, I'm, I'm not too sure. I think maybe I'd rather sit back and just watch <laughs> and, and see what, what happens with other people. These are questions that we have in, in our churches because we're talking about supernatural business here. And by supernatural, I mean outside of our nature, outside of what we can do on our own. So here's the deal that I'm going to make with you. Here is the response that I'm asking for this Sunday morning in this conference, that you come back tonight. Rather than giving you a response this morning, here's your response. You're going to set an alarm for what, 530 if you want food. Okay, if you don't want food, if you want to stop off at McDonald's, then you'll be here at, at 6.30. Okay, and that is your response. To get that alarm set on your phone, just put it on there, write church tonight, 
be here tonight. If you are under 12 and you can bring me something that you learned or that you drew, I will have a dollar for you tonight. So whoever's taking me for lunch, make sure I find an, a bank somewhere <laughs> and get some ones. And we will see you back tonight. And we're going to begin discussing. And when I say discussing, we're in the fellowship, all right? We will have some, some ability to have questions and answers. I'll have teaching with PowerPoint, but we're going to be able to have a discussion on some of these things because your pastor's heart is that the church here, River of Life, Assemblies of God in Devil's Lake, Iowa, is truly Devil's Lake, North Dakota. I was in Iowa last week. <laughs> they have Spirit Lake, which sounds holier. Yeah. Devil's Lake, North Dakota, um, the right state there, his heart is to see that the kingdom of God is represented in all of its power in your lives, individually and corporately as a church. And his desire is that your children and your grandchildren will grow up in a place where they see the power of God and know that for them there is something that in a world that is falling apart and crazy and a generation crippled with anxiety and hopelessness and depression will have a place to come where the power of God gives hope and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen? And so he has carved out this time on the calendar just for you. Don't neglect the call of your pastor to come together and learn and seek for more of what God has for us. Amen? I want to pray with you, and then I'll see you tonight. Lord, I thank you for the heart of the leadership of this church to seek to have this weekend carved out to learn more about the Holy Spirit and what it means to be Spirit-filled and what it looks like for a congregation to represent the kingdom of God in a community. And Lord, I pray that you would, during this time that we have carved out, Lord, that your Spirit would be present with us that we would hear your voice and that we, we would respond in obedience to exactly what you have and exactly when you have it, nothing more and nothing less. Lord, I pray that you would use us just as you used that first century church and just as you used that little church in Los Angeles for its time. Lord, may this be our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will see you tonight. Amen. Kathy, you want to come to the piano if you would? Let's stand together this morning. Uh, just as we uh, wrap things up, uh, just a, a couple of things. Uh, again, make every effort you can to be here tonight, tomorrow night. I believe this. The Bible says that uh, we'll love the Lord our God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And sometimes we focus on the uh, emotional, experiential part of the Holy Spirit, and we don't spend time just actually thinking, you know what, this, this actually appeals to our intellect as well. Uh, there is reason behind this. And uh, that is why we are doing what we're doing. A conference, again, it's not just where one person talks, it's interaction. And that is our desire for tonight, tomorrow night is maybe you got some questions about this. And uh, we are certainly not just going to have just questions and answers. We are going to allow for time as well to experience what we're talking about. Similar to what the pattern was uh, uh, in, the, in the early church there, okay? We'll talk about it, we're going to study it, and then we're going to pray and say, God, we want to experience it. This has got to be something more than just in our head. Uh, as we uh, uh, wrap things up, uh, I do want to, uh, for those of you that are watching online, uh, we were... I was debating about whether we make this public or not. We actually are planning on live streaming the service tonight. Um, we're going to be doing it on Facebook Live, those of you that are watching. That is not to give any of you a reason to not come, okay? Uh, but we just recognize that there's some people that are not able to come. Uh, people part of our church, again, that are not feeling well, not well enough to come, or, or even just out of state, some of them right now. And so we want to make sure to connect with them. Uh, but we will be streaming live uh, this evening uh, for the service and for our time together. Uh, Last of all, again, just encourage you to, uh, uh, we want to be a blessing to Ruthie as she has been to us. 
So would you uh, actually, whatever you, you're planning just to give, and I know some of you may have already given in the, in the donation boxes, but uh, I just encourage you maybe to consider uh, just giving something specifically to Ruthie. Uh, again, we want to be a blessing to her. So if that's your uh, choice, if you want to do that on your check or offering envelope, just designate Ruthie on there, and we'll make sure that that gets to her. Again, the donation boxes are in the back as you head out. Uh, I'm going to dismiss Darren and Amy and Renee. You can go ahead and go back to the conference room. And those of you that are interested in just real quick, uh, that first look alpha, you can just pop back there and they'll be ready to talk to you. I'll be back there in just a moment. But let's uh, let's pray. And then uh, hopefully again, we'll see you this evening. God, thank you. Thank you for the incredible heritage that we have. Lord, thank you that this is something, Lord, that is that is so much bigger, so much bigger that you've called us to. And Lord, the privilege and opportunity that we have to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, we just thank you for that. Lord, what, what an amazing opportunity we have. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just continue to guide us, continue to direct us. Lord, as we talked about last Sunday, Lord, the last two weeks, Lord, believing that the pillar is, in fact, moving. Lord, you are moving us as a church to new areas, to new territory, to, to new areas of influence. And, Lord, we cannot do that apart from your spirit, and we cannot do that apart from connecting with each other as the body as well. So, Lord, I believe that these times together in the next couple of evenings, Lord, are critical for us as a church, and we thank you. Thank you that you have given us that privilege and that power to do what you have called us to do. So, Lord God, I just speak blessing right now on every individual, every child, Lord, every uh, teenager, every young adult. Guide and direct us throughout this week. Lord, again, uh, supernatural, divine appointments would take place even this week. Lord, that we would be able to share the things that you've already revealed to us. God, that we would be faithful and obedient to what you have called us to do. And Lord, it's our desire again that everyone would experience God, that we would love people, and that we would share Christ. Lord, as we leave this place today, and we give you the praise now, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching online. Again, hope to see you guys this evening.